people haven't changed much in 600 years. When a plague or pandemic hits the community, fear always comes along with it. And fear is contagious. It can give some of us sleepless nights or anxious days. None of us want ourselves or the people we love to get seriously ill. But when the authorities restrict our freedom of travel and our movement in the community, some of us get angry. People often look around and try and figure out who or what was to blame for the crisis. In the 14th century, it was said that the plague was God's way of punishing people for their sins. It's ironic that a minister in Louisiana used almost the same identical words after Hurricane Katrina devastated New Orleans exactly 15 years ago today, August the 23rd. 2005. Time and again throughout the centuries and even today, people blame a pandemic on others because of their skin color or because of their religion or because of their ethnic origin. People blame politicians, they blame a foreign country, they even blame our own government. Some people blame doctors and nurses and various healthcare professionals. Some people violently attack those who they blame. I know of folk who insist it's all just a hoax. I've even met four people who vociferously believe that the pandemic is part of a sinister conspiracy. Ideas, feelings, and behaviors, all driven by fear, repeated over and over, generation after generation. Well, no matter what we feel about this virus, we all know that in just six months, so much of our normal has been upended, whether we like it or not. And right now, Zooming Church reminds us that our Christian community has been disrupted. Jesus told us to come together to share bread and wine, to remember him. And the writer to the Hebrews told us not to give up on meeting together together with other believers. For months now, we haven't been able to follow these teachings. We miss the beauty of the familiar. We are living a here and now challenge. How do we transform our corporate life as a Christian community and keep our faith worshipful, warm and welcoming? Well, be of good cheer. Previous generations have also faced huge life and community changing events and with God's guidance, we will come through this. Unwelcome changes are now the backdrop to our lives. More than ever, you and I need to keep a strong grip on the foundations of our faith. So let's look at one part of the gospel reading with this need in mind. You heard just a few minutes ago, Jesus asking his followers how other people view him. And then he asked them the same in question, who do you say that I am? And Peter blurts out, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus commends him and says, but Peter, you didn't figure this out by yourself. God helped you see this truth. Many of us, as we read the New Testament, look at Peter and we see a walking train wreck. So I, I imagine on this occasion, Peter might have felt, wow, I actually got this right. And then, oh, God guiding me? And I didn't know that was happening. And as the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles document this way of life for Peter, continuing failures, continuing to do his own thing, and also amazing growth as God continued to inspire him. And in response, Peter became more open to God's Spirit. Why do we ever imagine? that the disciples had an easier time of being open to transformation than we do. Peter became aware of God's presence in his daily life. Perhaps this was the first time he became aware of God's closeness. On another occasion, Jesus told his followers that he would be leaving them, but not leaving them comfortless. He would send the comforter, the source of life and strength, the Holy Spirit, to be with them. 
and the Holy Spirit would lead them into all truth. You and I are also his followers. We too have received this gift of the Holy Spirit. For all of us, there are moments when we become aware of God, the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives. And this awareness often becomes clearer in retrospect. These days, we continue to try and live the way of life that Jesus showed those first followers. And we mess up just like the disciples did. We need the Holy Spirit just as much as they did. Regardless of all the chaos and uncertainty in today's world, we are not abandoned. We're not left out. We are not discarded, even when we feel depressed, frightened, lonely, or worthless. We need to remember and hold on to the fact that we are cherished. Now is a really good time to become more aware of just what the Holy Spirit does in our lives, day in and day out. When I say our lives, I do mean all of our lives. Recently, I've been reading a book entitled The Explorer's Guide to Julian of Norwich, and it's written by Veronica Mary Rolf. And in case you're thinking this is nepotism run wild, we have the same sounding name, but spelt differently, so we're not relatives. And as Veronica wrote, Julian of Norwich lived in the 14th century. She was an uneducated woman from a middle-class family, and she was not a nun. She wrote about what she experienced when she was just 30 years old, a series of very clear revelations of Christ's love for her and for all people, past, present, and future. For the rest of her long life, she often went back in her heart and reflected on these life-changing experiences. She was able to help other people with their experience of the Christian faith in the middle of the recurring, deadly pandemic of the 14th century. Okay, Julian didn't experience COVID-19, but she and her family did live through uncertainty and anxiety as they endured the plague five times. The first time the plague ravaged her hometown, Julian was a little girl of just six years old. In her book about Julian, Veronica asks you and me to reflect on the experience of Christ's revelations in our lives, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to quote Veronica's writing because I think she puts it very nicely. She says, If we examine our lives carefully, we may realize that we have had spiritual experiences of our own, revelations or sudden insights that we cannot explain. Some of us have received extraordinary cures. We've been saved in accidents. We've been blessed with great gifts and granted special graces. We've been brought through illnesses, through doubts, and through depressions. People have spoken to us in dreams to encourage us, at other times to warn us, and at times to forgive us. Perhaps we've also had mystical experiences while looking at a sunset when we're listening to music, standing on the beach, during the Eucharistic liturgy, reading a passage of scripture, or those times when we're in contemplative prayer. At such times, we have felt the overpowering presence of divine love. We were given clear directives. We were healed of our spiritual wounds. These close encounters with God bolster our faith, renew our hope. They become powerful sources of strength in hard times. That is, if we remember them. Unfortunately, we tend not to reflect on our spiritual experiences often enough, so we forget the impact they once made on us. You notice that Veronica emphasized if we remember them. Over the years, people have told me about their personal spiritual experiences. Often an experience came to them as a, as a surprise. They told me of their encounters with the Holy Spirit in everyday life. Retelling their story was encouraging for both of us. Later, as I reflected on that person's story, this helped me revisit the holy times the Holy Spirit 
has come into my life. And I want to emphasize, all of us have these encounters with the Holy Spirit, even if we are not in the habit of noticing them. The times when we become aware of the Holy Spirit in our lives are good experiences to review and to reflect on. Holding on to these experiences is a real lifeline when just trying to get through the day feels difficult or upsetting. I'm writing up my private logbook to help me better remember and reflect on my spiritual experiences. I can see just how much I've allowed myself to forget these happenings. So easily I become preoccupied with daily trivia, like trying to remember when I'm supposed to take out the garbage or when I plan to take the car to the car wash. Perhaps you also have a similar habit of getting preoccupied with mundane stuff. I encourage you to make a logbook of the spiritual experiences in your life so that when you have hard times, you can draw strength from reviewing these events. Better still, don't wait for difficulties. Reflect on your logbook items often. This is all about you and I nurturing our faith, keeping it real, keeping us present in the now and staying well grounded. We need to become more accustomed to trusting the presence of the Holy Spirit in our daily living. This awareness will also help you and I bring strength and peace to others in this time of doubt and uncertainty. Let's just pray together. Holy Wisdom, Mother God, you hold our time in your hands. Your providence guides the stars and guides the cells in our bodies. Your compassion opens our hearts to healing in the midst of pain. Help us rest in you, trusting the future in your care and giving comfort to those who mourn, to those who hurt, and to those who face personal challenges. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen.